Good morning. Welcome to the June 2019 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take a, mo a moment this morning to recognize the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. On June 6th of 1944, more than 160,000 Allied troops landed along a 50-mile stretch of the beaches of Normandy and began the liberation of Western Europe from the Nazis. Today is a day for honoring the bravery of those soldiers and sailors and airmen who fought to defeat fascism. And it's also a day to honor the sacrifice of the over 4,000 Allied military, including over 2,000 Americans who died on that single day. As President Reagan said uh, 35 years ago today at Pointe du Hoc, uh, let us make a vow to our dead. Let us show them by our actions that we understand what they died for, strengthened by their courage, heartened by their valor, and born by their memory, let us continue to stand for the ideals for which they lived and died. Words that resonate today just as they did in 1984. Uh, with that, Madam Associate Secretary, uh, would you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear three items for your consideration. First, you will consider a declaratory ruling and third order of proposed Third, beg your pardon. Third, further notice of proposed rulemaking that, among other things, would clarify that voice service providers may block illegal and unwanted calls as the default before they reach consumers' phones, and propose a safe harbor for providers that block calls that fail call authentication. Second, you will consider a report and order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking that would vacate the Commission's 2008 Least Access Order, modernize the existed Least Access Rules to reflect modernize the existing least access rules to reflect changes in the video programming market and propose to simplify the least access rate formula. Third, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would propose to modernize the Commission's rules to improve aviation safety, support the deployment of more advanced avionics technology, and increase the efficient use of limited spectrum resources. This is your agenda for today. The first item, entitled Advanced Methods to Target and Eliminate Unlawful Robocalls, Call Authentication Trust Anchor, will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Patrick Weber, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Weber, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. Today I am pleased to introduce an item that addresses the problem of unwanted and illegal robocalls. Protecting consumers from these bothersome calls is the Commission's top consumer protection priority. And today, we present a declaratory ruling and third further notice of proposed rulemaking that continues the Commission's efforts on that front. Among other protections, the item before you enables voice service providers to target and block calls that analytics reveal are those likely to be scams or other unwanted calls. And for the first time, consumers won't have to do anything to benefit from this but do have the choice to opt out of call blocking if they'd prefer to receive all calls. Before turning the presentation over to CGB staff, I would like to thank the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities for their valuable assistance. With me this morning are Kurt Schroeder, Chief of CGB's Consumer Policy Division. Christy Thornton, Acting Deputy Division Chief, Karen Schroeder, Attorney Advisor, Jerusha Burnett, Attorney Advisor, Eric Berger, the Commission's Chief Technology Officer, and Pam Arluck, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau's Competition Policy Division. Jerusha will present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The declaratory ruling and third further notice of proposed rulemaking before you continues the Commission's work in targeting unwanted and illegal robocalls. Every year, the Commission receives hundreds of thousands of consumer complaints about unwanted calls. In 2018 alone, we received 232,000 of these complaints. While these calls are a regular and ongoing nuisance, many pose real threats, such as fraud or identity theft. 
The Commission has previously made clear that voice service providers may block certain categories of calls where the caller ID is clearly spoofed. The Commission has not addressed where the caller ID is not spoofed or where the caller spoofs a legitimate in-service number. Today's item takes steps to allow voice service providers to block these types of robocalls before they reach consumers' phones without requiring consumers to sign up first. The declaratory ruling makes clear that voice service providers may offer certain robocall blocking tools to their customers. First, it clarifies that voice service providers may, as the default, block calls based on reasonable call analytics that target unwanted calls, so long as their customers are informed and have the opportunity to opt out. Second, it clarifies that voice service providers may offer customers the ability to block calls from any number that does not appear on the customer's whitelist or contact list on an opt-in basis. These clarifications enable providers to now offer consumers more powerful tools to stop unwanted calls. The third further notice of proposed rulemaking proposes and seeks comment on other forms of blocking based on the shake and stir caller ID authentication framework, proposes to stop steps to ensure that emergency calls are not blocked, and seeks comment on requiring voice service providers to implement the shake and stir framework. First, it proposes to create a safe harbor for voice service providers that block maliciously spoofed calls and seeks comment on extending that safe harbor to the blocking of calls that are unsigned and originate on networks of certain categories of voice service providers. Second, it proposes to require voice service providers that block calls to establish a critical calls list, including outbound numbers of 911 call centers and government emergency outbound numbers to ensure that emergency calls reach consumers. Third, it seeks comment on protections and remedies for callers whose calls are erroneously blocked. Finally, it seeks comment on requiring voice service providers to implement the shake and stir framework in the event that major voice service providers fail to implement the framework by the end of 2019. Taken together, these proposals seek to protect consumers from illegal robocalls and ensure the effectiveness and integrity of the shake and stir caller ID authentication framework, while also ensuring that the most important calls are never blocked. We recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burnett, for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the outset, let me thank Chairman Pai for his enormous leadership on the fight to eliminate bad robocalls. He's been incredibly focused on reducing this perverse problem. I'm at a lack to see more things or steps the chairman could do on the matter. Like my fellow commissioners, I share the desire to eliminate the menace of illegal robocalls and believe that this item is very well intended, though I nonetheless wonder if it may lead to certain problematic consequences. Completely legitimate organizations and businesses regularly engage in so-called robocalling to provide consumers with critical and time-sensitive information, such as fraud alerts, flight schedule changes, school closures, delivery window delays, prescription notices, appointment reminders, public safety alerts, and yes, anti-delinquency notices. Efforts to attack illegal and fraudulent calls should not restrict or prevent these beneficial robocalls. To ensure lawful calls are delivered to consumers, I've urged carriers to adopt expeditious processes to correct call blocking and labeling errors. We should applaud providers for offering such services to their customers, generally free of charge, and I've supported the adoption of safe harbors from Communications Act liability. However, formally, uh, uh, formalizing redress mechanisms is a necessary corollary Corally, especially for blocking performed at the network level and not subject to consumer consent. And that is why in November 2017, illegal, in the legal robocall blocking order, I sought inclusion of a further notice seeking comment on adopting mechanisms to ensure swift redress for erroneous blocked calls. I have heard countless accounts of erroneous blocking and labeling both prior to and in the aftermath of the 2017 order and welcome the adoption of a further item in response to that record in prompt course. 
Notably, that 2017 order only allowed carriers to block very circumscribed categories of calls, namely calls that do not do, on a do not originate list, those from invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers. That's a narrower universe than the vast range of calls affected by today's declaratory ruling, which enables opt-out blocking of illegal and unwanted calls. While I fully and wholeheartedly support commission efforts to purge illegal calls from our networks, I am concerned about encouraging default blocking of so-called unwanted calls. Categories like wanted and unwanted can be somewhat vague and subjective, to put it mildly. Giving carriers such vast discretion to decide which carriers are unwanted could lead to wanted calls containing highly pertinent consumer information being blocked. Further, to the extent that carriers may block calls by virtue of their reasoned, reasonable analytics, that term seems to invite similar risk of problematic blocking. While there are very sophisticated call analytics services on the market that boast very low error rates, we don't favor any particular maximum error rate or the use of analytics of a certain caliber. Since the treatment of a given call has been shown to vary from service to service, callers could experience unpredictable call completion outcomes. Excuse me. As any email user knows, spam filters, which operate through similar analytics, are by no means perfect. Almost everyone has had the experience of missing important messages because of an oversensitive filter. For a service that is generally free and unregulated, I can accept that burden to go to the spam filter periodically to look for erroneous labeled emails. That same circumstance doesn't exist for voice calls, which have been hyper-regulated for decades and do not feature a mechanism to indicate what has been missed. To the extent that providers implement this new default regime, I worry that consumers will only realize that important voice calls have been blocked after it's too late. I sought to rectify this potential harm by requesting that the item at a minimum require carriers to implement a redress process for erroneous blocked, call, blocked calls. After all, even the CEO of First Orion, one of the largest analytics companies and likely beneficiaries of this item, recently sat in my office and stressed the need for mechanisms to respond to blocking complaints effectively and expeditiously, in, the, in his words, in hours, not days. Procedurally, this didn't fit the declaratory ruling. However, the chairman did agree to add language noting that a reasonable blocking program would include a mechanism for resolving complaints. That is a huge step forward, even if it may not provide a complete respite from blocking purgatory. I thank the chairman for recognizing the need for this effective redress. In availing themselves of the declaratory ruling, providers will need to exercise great vigilance in their call blocking efforts and establish meaningful safeguards for consumers and legitimate callers. I hold out hope that all goes well because there's so much at stake. At the same time, put me down as someone open to refining some of its points in the item as we go forward. Nonetheless, I'm going to dissent on one smaller issue, the draft's delegation to Bureau Authority to collect any and all relevant information from voice service providers to prepare reports on the state of call blocking. I worry the language is, un is breathtakingly expansive and gives the Bureau virtually unlimited authority to demand whatever it wishes from carriers. I've raised concerns about past delegation and see this as not necessary, even if it's based on good intentions. Accordingly, I will vote to approve the vast portion of the item and dissent on that one piece. I thank the chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Americans are fed up with robocalls. They're tired of scam artists lighting up their phones. They're done with fraudsters placing calls at all hours of the day and night. And they're sick of spoofed numbers tricking them into picking up their phone. As a result, many Americans, myself included, rarely answer their cell phones unless the number is already in their contact list. All of this is why the FCC has elevated robocalls to our top enforcement priority. We've imposed major fines on illegal callers. We've created a reassigned numbers database to combat unwanted calls, and we've proposed rules to target illegal calls that originate overseas. It's now time for wireless carriers to step up their own efforts. And with today's decision, we make clear that they have the power to do so. This decision removes any doubt that carriers can block calls before they even reach a consumer's phone. And it clarifies that carriers can offer customers the option of blocking all calls 
that don't appear on their white list or a contact list. And I expect carriers will use this decision to take immediate and additional action to combat illegal calls. To ensure that providers do step up their efforts, I ask my colleagues to expand today's notice to seek comment on setting up a robocall scorecard. The idea is pretty straightforward. It's to publicize data on each carrier and how effective they are at targeting illegal calls. By bringing transparency to these metrics, we could enhance consumer choice and create additional incentives for carriers to continue their efforts to crack down on illegal calls. So I look forward to seeing how the record develops on that idea. Finally, our action today is no silver bullet. It's part of a series of actions we're taking to break the back of illegal robocalls. Another important step will be the industry's implementation of the shake and stir call authentication framework. And on this score, I want to commend Chairman Pai for expanding today's notice to seek comment on requiring carriers to implement this framework. By seeking comment today, we're now in a position to move directly to an order if industry's own efforts to implement the regime fall short. So I want to thank the staffs of the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau for your work, the Office of Economics and Analytics, and the Wireline Competition Bureau for your diligent work on this item. I look forward to continuing to work with all stakeholders, and the item has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Robocalls keep getting worse, and consumers are paying the price. At the start of this administration, Americans received roughly 2 billion robocalls a month. That number is now about 5 billion a month. That is about 2,000 robocalls every second of every day. That's insane. Given the explosion of these nuisance calls, it is no wonder that consumers are complaining in droves. They are complaining here at the Federal Communications Commission. They are seeking redress with our colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission. They are registering their righteous anger in state houses, in courthouses, and on Capitol Hill. They're frustrated, and they are seeking a fix. They know this mess of calls and our failure to do anything about them is just not right. So today, the FCC kicks off a very long overdue rulemaking to require call authentication technology. And then we expressly authorize phone companies to deploy technology to block robocalls across the network unless a consumer opts out. As far as this new blocking technology goes, so far, so good. But there is one devastating problem with our approach. There is nothing in our decision today that prevents carriers from charging consumers for this blocking technology to stop robocalls. I think robocall solutions should be free to consumers, full stop. I do not think that this agency should pat itself on the back for its efforts to reduce robocalls and then tell consumers to pay up. They are already paying the price. In scams flooding our phone lines, wasted time responding to false and fraudulent calls, offering us what we did not ask for, do not want, and do not need, and a growing distrust in our most basic communications. I like hope. But I am not interested in pinky promises. I think we should be upfront and clear with consumers that today's decision offers no more than an expectation that phone companies installing this technology will not charge consumers a premium for its use. But every one of us knows there is nothing enforceable about an expectation. There is nothing here that prevents companies from charging each of us whatever additional fees they want to put this call blocking technology on our line. I'm a consumer too. I receive robocalls at home, in my office, on my landline, on my mobile. I've even received multiple robocalls sitting here on this dais. I want it to stop. But I do not believe I should have to pay for that privilege. I am disappointed that for all of our efforts to support new blocking technology, we couldn't muster up the courage to do what consumers want most stop robocalls, and do it for free. On this aspect of today's decision, I dissent. 
Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 1938, the Bell telephone system ran a print. Advertisement that began with the following words, this very hour, millions of words are being spoken by telephone. Friends talk to friends and two lives are happier because of it. The ad concludes by saying, quote, day and night, the country over, these oft repeated words reflect the value of the telephone. I'm glad that you call, close quote. Well, some things change and some things remain the same. This very hour, there are millions of words between friends and loved ones that are being exchanged. But we also know at this very hour, there are millions of robocalls that are bombarding our consumers, 6.4 million per hour to be exact. And in large part, these are not making our lives happier, very much far from it. The calls range from being a nuisance or disruptive to being deceptive and dangerous and causing unwitting consumers to be defrauded out of their hard paid money. Typically, these calls do not reflect the value of phone service, but are more likely devaluing the service to a point that consumers are dropping phones at an alarming rate. And I think it is safe to say that folks are not quote unquote glad about the, <laughs> I think it's safe to say that glad is not the four letter word that most <laughs> would conclude with these calls. I've said it before and I'll say it again, robocalls have changed the fabric of our culture. If you get a call and you don't recognize that number, you don't pick up the phone. And often these calls are spoofed to make it look like they are coming from a local business or neighbor and this pernicious practice makes it hard and we can't differentiate between unwanted robocalls and those that are from our doctor or from our kids' schools or from our pastor. And put simply, by allowing these calls to proliferate, we've broken the phone service in this country. We need to take a holistic approach to combating robocalls by combining the technological tools, policy fixes, and strong enforcement. <coughs> Stemming the tide of illegal robocalls should be one of the Commission's top priorities, and we should consider any and all ideas, new or old, to put a real dent in this growing problem. We must target illegal robocalls throughout their life cycle, from preventing scam calls from originating on the network in the first instance, and empowering consumers to block unwanted calls from ever reaching their phones. The Commission must take action. Consumers demand it. It is incumbent upon us to take these positive steps to thwart illegal robocalls and empower consumers to take back control over their phones. The, the American people are looking at us to lead. We must do so aggressively, intentionally, and quickly. I do support today's item. I am hopeful that clarifying that providers may offer informed opt-out call blocking services will make these tools available to millions more consumers as soon as possible. I appreciate that this item notes that these services should not negatively impact emergency calls or rural call completion obligations, and I'm glad that we'll now be positioned to act on mandating caller ID authentication by the end of the year if needed, if not sooner. I was supportive of, of edits proposed by my colleagues to ensure that such blocking is uh, offered in a competitively neutral and non-discriminatory way, to study the impact of blocking on 911 and public safety, and to empower consumers to gather additional information about the effectiveness of call blocking solutions. I'm also supportive of revisions proposed by my colleagues to, that provide callers with a mechanism to dispute blocked calls that may have been misidentified, provided that consumers remain in the driver's seat throughout the process. And I would like to extend my thanks to the chairman and my colleagues for their support of a section that I proposed where we add an item requiring that the uh, CGB in consultation with WCB and public safety to gather information from carriers and produce a series of comprehensive reports on the deployment and impl implementation of call blocking and caller ID authentication. As I've made clear in a number of recent items, it is imperative that in dealing with the most significant issues of telecommunications policy, the Commission must gather and rely on clear and accurate data. Specifically at my request, the item will now give us critical feedback on how our tools are performing. It will study the availability of call blocking solutions, the fees charged, if any, for these services, the effectiveness of various categories of call blocking tools, an assessment of the number of subscribers availing themselves of call blocking tools. The item now also asks that uh, the reports assess the impact of previous commission rules and changes and critically will include information on the state of deployment for caller ID authentication 
through the shake and stir framework for the first time ever. This data analysis will be critical to ensuring that we finish the job of protecting and empowering consumers. I push to modify the item to explicitly delegate authority to CGB to collect any and all relevant information and data from voice service providers necessary to complete these reports, including authoritative data about the number of illegal robocalls transitioning our phone system, the number of calls blocked false positives, false negatives, and other relevant data points. I will review these reports with great interest and expect that they will enable the Commission to act quickly if warranted. And finally, let me also be clear that I expect call blocking services to be offered to consumers for free. I would note that this item makes it abundantly clear that providers who implement these services will save billions to their network as capacity is freed up and customer service representatives field fewer complaints. Making phone service usable again, and I believe will cause fewer consumers to cancel their phone services and perhaps some will start to come back. And against this backdrop, in my view, I would have serious, serious concerns with a carrier that includes a line item on consumers' bills or otherwise charges them for these, series, for these services. The CGB reports will be critical in informing our next steps as a commission. If we see that carriers are in fact charging consumers for these blocking services, I have added language requiring the Commission to propose rules prohibiting those carriers from doing so. And I will review those forthcoming reports on this topic again. So I take it back to old Ma Bell. While it may seem quaint or even nostalgic, I do long for the day when I can use my phone again fully and in the way that I want. And I know from my travels across the country that I'm very much not alone. Bringing phone service to every corner of our nation is one, our, one of our defining achievements, and voice service still plays a critical role in our communications network. As the old ad put it, quote, greetings and best wishes are exchanged, affairs of business are transacted, a doctor comes quickly in answer to a hurried call, close quote. I'm looking forward to once again uttering the words, I'm glad that you called. I'm hopeful that our actions today will bring us a step closer to getting back to that. I vote to approve. Many thanks to CGB, WCB, that have ably led a charge on this uh, and other items tackling these vexing issues. And I thank you in advance for undertaking the important work of measuring and reporting on the effectiveness of our effort to combat robocall. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Starks. In the three weeks since I announced that the FCC would be voting on my proposal to allow telephone companies to block unwanted robocalls by default, I've heard from many Americans across the country. Here's a sampling of what they've had to say. First, I read with great delight in the Wall Street Journal today that you are proposing to allow carriers to analyze network traffic to spot and block certain robocalls. Please, please, please do so. I am retired and have been on the do not call list for years. I get at least five spam calls per day or telemarketer calls. I have stopped answering my telephone unless the caller name is displayed. Another one. Please respect the wishes of a vast majority of citizens who wish to free their lives from automatic robot calling. Stop robocalls. Another. I was so happy to hear about your plan to allow carriers to block the robocalls. I've been so depressed because I feel these robocalls have absconded with my expensive iPhone. There is simply no rest from these calls. Another, I just read today's paper about your plan to block robocalls, and I support it. I get two or three robocalls per day. It has to be stopped. Please move ahead as soon as possible. Another, I received over 500 robocalls from the end of February until the end of March of this year from so-called health insurance. These calls all came from spoofed phone numbers. Why would any legitimate company have to spoof their phone number to try to solicit business? The calls slowed down for a few weeks but are now kicking up again. Today, I've received eight calls with no voicemails. I now have to put my phone on do not disturb so I can get my peace. You will be my hero, and I dare say millions of other Americans, if you actually put an end to this harassment. Another, 
Do not side with the businesses that want to harass our fellow citizens. We are getting international and domestic robocalls at all hours of the day, including the early AM hours from countries like Lithuania. This has to stop. And finally, following my op-ed in this morning's USA Today, and I quote, hooray for our FCC chairman, unquote. That was from my mom. <laughs> She's still a consumer. Uh, these voices are representative of what I hear when I travel across the United States, except that they contain no expletives. If there's one thing in our country today that unites Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, socialists and libertarians, vegetarians and carnivores, Ohio State and Michigan fans, it is that they are sick and tired of being bombarded by unwanted robocalls. And my message to the American people today is simple. We hear you and we are on your side. Since the beginning of 2017, fighting illegal robocalls has been the FCC's top consumer protection priority. In the last two years, for example, we've expressly authorized phone companies to block certain categories of calls that are highly likely to be illegal, such as calls purporting to be from unassigned, unallocated, or invalid phone numbers. We've taken steps to address the problem of unwanted calls to reassign numbers by authorizing the creation of a reassigned numbers database. We've taken strong enforcement action against illegal robocallers, imposing or proposing almost a quarter billion dollars in forfeitures against callers for illegal spoofed calls. And we've demanded that industry develop and implement by the end of this year caller ID authentication, a critical component in the fight against illegal caller ID spoofing. But, as Commissioner Carr pointed out, there isn't a silver bullet to solving the problem of unwanted robocalls. So today, we take additional steps as part of our comprehensive strategy to combat what former Senator Fritz Hollings once rightly called the scourge of civilization. Most importantly, we clarify that phone companies may immediately start offering call blocking programs by default, based on any reasonable analytics designed to identify unwanted calls, so long as consumers are given the choice to opt out. There are many tools right now that are effective in blocking unwanted calls before they reach consumers. But their deployment has been limited because they've only been made available on an opt-in basis. And many of the consumers who would most benefit from these tools, such as elderly Americans, are unaware that they can opt in. We believe today's clarification will make it easier for consumers to participate in and benefit from call blocking programs. We also want to ensure that consumers can make an informed decision whether to remain in a call blocking program or not. And that's why we are requiring providers to clearly disclose to their customers what types of calls may be blocked and the potential risks of blocking wanted calls while providing them with an opt out mechanism. We also clarify that providers may allow consumers to opt in to more aggressive blocking services. Specifically, Carriers can permit, their own, uh, can permit consumers to use their own smartphone's contact lists as a white list and block calls not included on that list. I'm optimistic that all of these measures will meaningfully reduce the number of unwanted robocalls that Americans get. Now, of course, I recognize that not everyone is a fan of our approach. Some opponents themselves are subjecting consumers to unwanted robocalls. And well, my message to them is simple. This FCC will stand with American consumers, not with those who are badgering them with these unwanted robocalls. Now, I also recognize that some who make legitimate calls have expressed concern about our decision today. But I believe that we have appropriately addressed their concerns by making clear that any reasonable call blocking program offered by default must include a mechanism for allowing legitimate callers to register a complaint and for having that complaint resolved. And in that regard, I thank Commissioner O'Reilly for his input. Turning to the third further notice, we advanced significant proposals related to the caller ID authentication framework known as Shake and Stir. Shake and Stir will be critical in telling consumers whether the caller ID information they see is real or spoofed. And it can be used to assist with blocking spoofed calls. And that's why we are proposing a safe harbor for phone companies that choose to block calls that can't be authenticated under Shake and Stir. And when it comes to the implementation of Shake and Stir, I have made clear my expectation that major carriers will get this done by the end of this year. I believe that a voluntary industry-led process is most likely to achieve this goal. 
And to date, I have been pleased by the progress that industry has made and am optimistic that the end of the year deadline will be met. But in case it isn't, the FCC will not hesitate to take regulatory action. That's why today we are taking the necessary steps so that we'll be in a position to take regulatory action early next year, should that be required. In closing, I would like to express my thanks for my colleagues who offered edits during the last three weeks that have made this a better item. And I would also like to thank all of the Commission staff who worked so hard to bring the American people much needed relief from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, from the Enforcement Bureau, from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, from the Office of Economics and Analytics, from the Office of General Counsel, from the Office of the Managing Director, from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Your work on this item has been heroic, and I salute you for your efforts. With today's action, the FCC is taking a major step forward in the fight against unwanted robocalls. And now is the time for telephone companies to take the baton. I commend those carriers who have stepped up to the plate and have already indicated that they will implement call blocking services by default. And I encourage those who haven't already done so to listen to the American people and help us end this scourge. With that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Yes, on the majority item and no on one portion. Uh, Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenbrussel? Approve in part, dissent in part. Uh, Commissioner Starks? Approve. The chair votes to approve. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the fantastic work. Uh, Madam Associate Secretary, could you please take us to item number two on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the next item will be presented by the Media Bureau and is entitled Least Commercial Access, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative. Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Carey, whenever you and your team are ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Media Bureau presents a report in order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks to update our least access rules. These rules require cable operators to set aside channel capacity for commercial use by unaffiliated, unaffiliated video programmers. This item is the 13th order that the Commission has considered as part of its ongoing media modernization initiative. Joining me at the table are Martha Heller, Stephen Brokart, and Diana Sokolow of the Policy Division. Diana will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this report in order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking seeking to update the least access rules. The video marketplace has changed significantly since the Commission first adopted least access rules decades ago. Today, a wide variety of media platforms, including online platforms, are available to programmers as alternatives to least access. The report and order first vacates the Commission's 2008 least access order, which never went into effect due to a stay by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and the disapproval of the associated information collection requirements by the Office of Management and Budget. Vacating the 2008 order is consistent with today's highly competitive video marketplace. Second, the report and order modernizes our existing least access rules. It eliminates the requirement that cable operators make least access available on a part-time basis, and it provides that cable operators, regardless of system size, are only required to respond to bona fide least access requests. It also extends the time frame for providing responses to least access requests and permits cable operators to require least access programmers to pay a maximum application fee of $100 and a maximum deposit equivalent to 60 days of the applicable lease fee. In addition, it requires cable operators to provide contact information for the person responsible for least access matters. Finally, the further notice proposes to modify the least access rate formula so that rates will be specific to the tier on which the programming is carried. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the report in order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking, and it requests editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, starting with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As just stated, this order vacates the Commission's 20, 2008 Least Access Order, updates the existing Least Access Rules, expresses the Commission's view that the video marketplace has changed dramatically in recent years, with a wide variety of media platforms available for content creators to utilize 
for program distribution. In particular, I am pleased to see the Commission affirm that over-the-top providers and other digital avenues are substitutes for traditional video distribution. This is a viewpoint I have long advocated and one that I expect to inform the Commission's media regulations going forward. Regarding the specifics of the item, I believe eliminating the part-time access and requiring that cable operators only respond to bona fide requests will go a long way in cleaning up the operations of the statutory mandate and may provide the Congress with a compelling reason to revisit or even repeal the current statute. At a minimum, the rules adopted today will help cover the cost borne by operators that must respond to requests. As I've noted before, I'm not sure there ever was a golden age of lease access, but the Commission did regulate in this arena pursuant to congressional direction. Today, we are at least moving the needle in the right direction by helping to relieve the administrative burden of rules that certainly outlived their usefulness. Finally, as we continue to solicit feedback in the second further notice of proposed rulemaking, I will be particularly interested in reviewing the record that is developed around the question of whether leased access can further withstand further First Amendment scrutiny, whether our questions over the constitutionality of the original mandate at its inception, certainly the state of today's video programming marketplace raises heightened congress uh, congressional, excuse me, constitutional concerns. This is additionally relevant in the broader context of video regulation, beyond just leased access. In sum, I appreciate the substantial portion of the order dedicated to discussing the current video marketplace and expect continued conversation on this point with cons corresponding further action. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. The Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit have long recognized that leased access and related rules impinge on free speech. They do so by requiring cable providers to carry speech they may not otherwise choose to distribute. As a result, courts have consistently applied heightened First Amendment scrutiny to these types of provisions. And in the past, courts upheld the requirements against constitutional challenges based in no small part on the market conditions that prevailed in the 80s and 90s when Congress passed its least access laws. Back then, cable providers accounted for 98% of the pay TV market. If you wanted to distribute video content, you had virtually no choice other than to go through a local cable provider. So Congress enacted these laws to disrupt cable's bottleneck monopoly. Flash forward to today, and the market is drastically different. The monopoly conditions that courts relied on to uphold least access and its intrusion on free speech have completely eroded. That's why last June, when the FCC proposed to modernize our least access rules, I asked my colleague to seek comment on the First Amendment implications of our approach. I'm glad that we did. As the record here shows, over 99 percent of U.S. households now have access to at least three pay TV options. The Commission recognized this in 2015 when it adopted a presumption that all pay TV markets are competitive. And consumers now see robust video competition not just from MVPDs and broadcasters, but from online streaming services like Sling, Hulu, and Amazon, not to mention a nearly unlimited number of platforms like YouTube and Vimeo that enable virtually anyone to distribute programming to billions of potential viewers at little or no cost. There are now far more options for distributing content in reaching U.S. households than paying cable for carriage on their networks. All of this undermines the constitutional foundation of our least access regime. And as the order lays out, these First Amendment concerns provide an additional basis <laughs> for eliminating our part-time least access rules. So I'm glad that we're taking that step today. But the competitive marketplace we now see also casts substantial doubt on whether the remaining rules and requirements could withstand First Amendment scrutiny. So I'm glad we seek additional comment in today's further notice on whether the broader least access regime remains consistent with the First Amendment. So I support today's order look forward to the record developing in the further notice, and I want to thank the Media Bureau for its work on the item. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. In the Cable Communications Policy Act, 
Congress charged the Federal Communications Commission with promoting competition in the delivery of diverse sources of video programming and to assure that the widest possible diversity of information sources are made available to the public. And those are the values that this agency has a duty to uphold and protect. They are the ones that inspired our least access policies, but those least access policies have long been stuck in regulatory limbo. For more than a decade, they have been stayed by the courts and stymied by data collection requirements at the Office of Management and Budget. So it's time for a reboot. And I support our effort to do so here today, but I have some concern about how we proceed because we have set the bar high for least access and have we have loaded it down with some newer requirements like deposits and full-time capacity channel purchases. So going forward, we will need to monitor how this new set of policies work in practice so that we can be sure that we are living up to our statutory responsibilities. Moreover, on the way to this outcome, I think this decision fundamentally misinterprets the First Amendment values that support our least access rules. In fact, I think the language in this order dismissing the constitutional foundation of our rules is overbroad and wrong, and I dissent in this respect. The First Amendment does more than protect the speech interests of corporations. As courts have long recognized, it is a force to support individual interest in self-expression and the right of the public to receive information and ideas. As Justice Black so eloquently put it, the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources is essential to the welfare of the public. Our least access rules provide opportunity for civic participation. They enhance the marketplace of ideas by increasing the number of speakers and the variety of viewpoints. They help preserve the possibility of a diverse, pluralistic medium, just as Congress called for in the Cable Communications Policy Act. The proper inquiry, then, is not simply whether corporations providing channel capacity have First Amendment rights, they do, but whether this law abridges expression that the First Amendment was meant to protect. Here, our least access rules are not content-based, and their purpose and effect is to promote free speech. Moreover, they accomplish this in a narrowly tailored way, and they do not substantially burden more speech than is necessary than to further important interests. In other words, they are not at odds with the First Amendment, but instead help effectuate its purpose for all of us. And finally, I do appreciate the focus on the First Amendment from my colleagues today, but I also wish that they were not so selective because I don't recall such swift and passionate commentary about the Constitution when the President asked us to take away broadcast licenses or when he pronounced a free press the enemy of the people or when it was revealed that Justice Department lawsuits are motivated by animus towards the content of news organizations. I don't think history will be kind to that silence so I look forward to them speaking up when this happens in the future. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In this item, the Commission considers our rules governing least access, a statutory requirement that allows independent programmers to purchase carriage on certain channels offered by cable providers. These rules have been in stasis since 2008, when rule changes made at the time were stayed by the DC Circuit. For 11 years, this proceeding has remained stuck, and I support the Commission's efforts to extricate itself from the morass and take a fresh look. And so on that account, I approve. However, I must dissent in part because I think that the First Amendment analysis offered by the majority here today goes too far and will put at risk a well-established cable carriage obligations and other parts of our telecommunications framework. Specifically, I'm concerned with the language in the report and order opining on whether our least access rules are consistent with the First Amendment. The majority here offers that there is, quote, substantial doubt on the foundation for our least access rules, close quote, essentially for one reason. That is the explosion of the internet has changed everything. I disagree. First and most basically, it doesn't change our fundamental duty to act according to the directives of Congress wherever it is spoken on a matter 
Indeed, lease access requirements have already withstood a facial First Amendment challenge with the courts, noting that the rules requiring cable operators to carry leased access channels were supported by important government interests in promoting diversity and competition in the video programming marketplace. The fact that uh, the majority of this commission may disagree with the statute or a judicial decision does not give us the authority to rewrite that statute and ignore the courts. Second, the constitutional reasoning and analysis advanced by the majority today is not in any way, as I read it, limited to the rules at issue here today. And so I believe it could have a far-reaching impact. I would urge my colleagues to proceed with caution and take a closer look. That the internet provides an alternative outlet for some Americans to view content is undeniable, but that alone should not result in a reinterpretation of our First Amendment pr principles with respect to cable. If it does, it will have a sweeping impact that will upend long-standing programming that Americans have come to rely on. Public educational government peg channels must carry elections of local broadcasters, our program carriage regime, and even, yes, children's programming. Finally, it is worth mentioning that the majority indicates that today's rule changes are, quote, independently and sufficiently supported by policy justifications, close quote. The constitutional analysis advanced here then seems to me to be extraneous language that does not animate our action here today. To that extent, it, it, it appears to me to essentially be dicta. For these reasons, I approve in part and dissent in part. Thank you to the Media Bureau for their hard work. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> 1984 saw many great and enduring contributions to our cultural heritage. Uh, Gremlins, The Terminator, This is Spinal Tap, and Footloose hit the silver screen. On TV, Happy Days aired its season finale, while Jeopardy! returned to the airwaves as a, as a syndicated program. And 35 years ago this month, arguably the greatest musical album of all time was released, with Prince appealing to legions with Purple Rain, When Doves Cry, and Let's Go Crazy. That same year, Congress mandated that cable operators provide independent video programmers leased commercial access, essentially to set aside channel capacity for unaffiliated programmers. Unlike the un entertainment milestones just discussed, leased access has not aged well. The video marketplace of 1984 is virtually unrecognizable today. Most Americans then only had access to a few broadcast stations and a single cable operator. At that time, leased access was intended to give independent programmers a unique chance to reach consumers. Today, our leased access regime is basically the Betamax of FCC video regulation. Today, programmers can and do create and share all sorts of video content online to a worldwide audience. More outlets exist to distribute programming than ever before. And content creators can even distribute their own programming. Indeed, as we speak, the FCC is distributing its own video programming online through a live stream. It is long since time to sync our least access rules with the times. And so today we vacate the 2008 Least Access Order, a troubled decision which never went into effect because of a judicial stay and disapproval from the Office of Management and Budget. We eliminate the requirement that cable operators provide part-time leased access, a mandate that is legally unnecessary. We decide that only bona fide requests from leased access programmers trigger obligations to respond from cable systems. And finally, we seek public input on a proposal to simplify the maddeningly complex leased access rate formula. All this is real progress, even against the backdrop of serious concerns that have been raised, concerns that I share about the constitutionality of this entire regime. For their efforts, I would like to thank the excellent staff of the Media Bureau and the Office of General Counsel, in particular Stephen Brockert, Michelle Carey, Katie Costello, Nancy Murphy, Holly Sauer, and Diane, Sok Diana Sucklow from the uh, Media Bureau, and Susan Aaron, James Carr, and David Consul from the Office of General Counsel. We appreciate your work on the entire Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative, and in particular, the incident effort, which has my full support. Uh, with that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly. Hi. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenversal? Approve in part, dissent in part. Commissioner Stark? Approve in part, dissent in part. 
Uh, the chair votes to approve the items adopted and editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the great work. And uh, Madam Associate Secretary, could you please take us to the last item Absolutely. on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the third item is entitled Amendment of the Commission's Rules to Promote Aviation Safety, WiMAX Forum Petition to Adopt Service Rules for the Aeronautical Mobile Airport Communication System, Petition of Sierra Nevada Corporation for Amendment of the Commission's Rules to Allow for Enhanced Flight Vision System Radar under Part 87, Petition of Aviation Spectrum Resources Incorporated for Amendment of Sections 87.173B and 87.263A of the FCC's rules to allow use of the lower 136 megahertz band by aeronautical en route stations. Petition of Airports Council International North America regarding aeronautical utility mobile stations. The item will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you. Uh, Chief Stockdale, okay. we turn to you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I am pleased to present to you the Aviation Safety Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. I am joined at the table today by Roger Noel, Tim McGuire, Scott Stone, and Jeff Tobias, all of the Wireless Bureau. <clears throat> In addition to those at the table, I would like to thank the Commission staff listed on the slide. Jeff will now present the item. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, I am pleased to present the Aviation Safety Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. This Notice of Proposed Rulemaking proposes changes to the Commission's Part 87 Aviation Radio Service Rules to support the deployment of more advanced avionics technology, increase the efficient use of limited spectrum resources, and generally improve aviation safety. The aviation industry uses radio communications to protect the safe of life and property, including to guide the takeoff, landing, and routing of aircraft, for radio navigation and obstacle avoidance, to provide information on weather conditions and other factors affecting flight safety, and to contact search and rescue authorities. The Commission regulates the aviation radio service in cooperation with the Federal Aviation Administration, which currently is developing and implementing the Next Generation Aviation System, or NextGen. NextGen will modernize the U.S. air transportation system to improve safety, efficiency, capacity, predictability, and resiliency. NextGen's data communications component will permit certain communications to be shifted from voice to data transmission, increasing speed and reliability, and reducing the risk of miscommunication. To facilitate this, the NPRM proposes to permit more flexible use of the VHF aeronautical band. The NPRM also proposes technical and service rules for the Aeronautical Mobile Airport Communication System, or Aeromax, an internationally standardized and harmonized system that will enable broadband communications for surface operations at airports between aircraft and other vehicles, as well as between critical fixed assets in support of NextGen. Proposals in the notice to improve safety in the air include rules to allow enhanced flight vision systems, which are airborne systems that supplement instrument landing systems in limited visibility environments, such as fog, to use millimeter wave radar. The NPRM also proposes to update our rules for audio visual warning systems. These systems use radar to detect aircraft as they approach a land-based obstruction, like an antenna tower, and automatically activate the warning lights until they are no longer needed. In addition, the NPRM includes proposals regarding Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB, which automatically broadcasts the aircraft's location, velocity, altitude, heading, etc to other aircraft and to ground stations for distribution to air traffic control systems. It is a key component of NextGen, and the FAA is mandating its use beginning next year. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you, Mr. Tobias, for the, uh, for the uh, presentation. We'll now turn to Commissioner O'Reilly for his comments. I'm going to spend my statement for the record. Thanks, oh, Mr. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Not so lucky. Ah. Uh, <laughs> there will also be a visual portion of this. So, uh, The FAA's Next Gen initiative aims to modernize air travel 
by incorporating new technology into aircraft, especially around in-flight communication. NextGen includes performance-based navigation, which takes advantage of GPS signals to route planes more efficiently, saving time and fuel. NextGen's data comm system allows pilots and air traffic controllers to communicate via text instead of by voice command, reducing the chance of misunderstandings and delays. An automatic, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, or ADS-B, transmits each aircraft's position, as we heard, its altitude, speed, and other information automatically so traffic controllers and other aircraft can safely coordinate flight paths. I learned more about this last technology from a pilot in Louisville's police department. Brian Arnold is the chief of Louisville's police helicopter division with more than 20 years of service. And when I joined him for one of his patrols above the city, he showed me some of the advanced communication technologies that allow him to coordinate with other law enforcement on the ground. With ADSB, Brian told me, air safety will be greatly improved by broadcasting in real time the exact position of every aircraft. But he also identified one way that this new technology could actually undermine public safety. Brian noted that criminals can easily obtain this new location information and use it to determine when police helicopters, border patrol, or even military aircraft take off and then monitor their exact flight paths and operations in real time. It's not difficult to imagine how criminals or foreign adversaries could take advantage of this new and easy access to location information to evade or undermine law enforcement activities as well as our national security interests. Indeed, the GAO issued a report last year that highlighted the security risks of openly transmitting flight and location information from DOD aircraft. It's information that anyone can obtain from a number of publicly accessible websites. Thankfully, the FAA is working on this issue. And time is of the essence, since all aircraft must comply with ADSB by January 2020. I asked my colleagues to expand today's notice to seek comment on the steps we can take, if any, to support the FAA's work to protect the security of law enforcement, public safety, and military operations as ADSB comes online. And I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to do so. I look forward to reviewing the record as it develops on this issue, and I want to thank the Wireless Bureau for its work on the notice. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenwistle. You know, the legend of Amelia Earhart, it captivates. She was responsible for so many aviation firsts. She was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and the first person to fly solo from the Hawaiian Islands to the continental United States. But despite all this, she is best known for how she disappeared. While on a record-setting flight circumnavigating the globe, she vanished over the Pacific Ocean. The wreckage from her plane was never found. There's something haunting about flights that disappear, and there is something very human about our desire to do something about it. But that urge is not limited to the legend of Amelia Earhart. It burns with every new report of a downed plane. Like 10 years ago, when an Air France flight was lost in the Atlantic Ocean, or five years ago, when Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 disappeared, or more recently, when an Indian Air Force plane was lost for good over the Bay of Bengal. In our always on and connected world, it just about feels impossible that we still lose track of flights. But the reality is that over international waters, air traffic controllers have no real time knowledge of where planes are located. Instead, they rely on flight plans, radio contact with pilots, and a system called ACARS that provides something like text message communications between planes and ground stations. But you know, a jet cruising at 500 knots an hour that disappears between 15 minute intervals for communications, well, that creates a potential search zone of roughly 65,637 miles. That's as big as the state of Florida. It's a lot of territory to cover. So to address this problem, the Federal Aviation Administration mandated that all United States aircraft must use a tracking system 
called Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB, as you heard my colleague just speak about. As a result, by 2021, aircraft will broadcast their global positioning system location each second. A network of ground stations across the country will collect this information and provide it to air traffic controllers. This is good, but there is one big problem. Those ground receivers need to be within 172 miles of aircraft to catch any signal. That means flights far out over the ocean are still vulnerable because there is a knowledge gap between the planes and the air traffic controllers they cannot reach. I think this agency can help if we get creative. And creativity here comes from looking above, not below. So let me explain. In 2015, following the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, countries around the world came together. They gathered at the World Radio Communications Conference and decided to harmonize some spectrum for something called space-based ADSB. The idea is simple. When our ground stations drop off, satellites can pick up. New payloads on satellites can be designed to detect ADSB signals wherever they are broadcast, whether over the ocean or a vast mountain range, finally providing continuous tracking of aircraft anywhere on Earth. In fact, some companies are already starting to test this idea. Now, today's rulemaking features a range of ideas to modernize aviation radio, from allocating spectrum for enhanced flight vision system radar, to updating the audible alerts that pilots hear in the cockpit, to enabling broadband communications to support airport operations. Now, at my request, it also includes a discussion about the possibilities for space-based ADSB. I think they're big. So I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to this discussion, and likewise, I want to thank the chairman for agreeing to my request to start a proceeding within six months to implement the World Radio Conference outcome from 2015. I hope that by doing so, we can make mysterious flight disappearances a thing of the past. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Legend has it that the first American aviation radio communication network uh, took place before World War I when two members of the Army's newly formed air service sent a signal from a plane-mounted transmitter to a ground-based receiver. Within a few years, pilots were talking to each other and ground from the air, although Morse code certainly remained the primary means of aviation communication till World War II. And into the 1950s, air crews relied not on radios, but on astro navigation to determine their position using a sextant, a map, the sun, and the moon and stars. The pilots of those days would be amazed at the communications and navigation tools available to modern aviators. Today, our technology not only provides reliable communications between and among aircraft and the ground, but also highly accurate navigation tools, whether updates, collision avoidance, automatic flight control, flight recording, and flight management services. We can even check our work emails from the air now, and I know how grateful you are for that. <laughs> Today's NPRM represents another step forward in ensuring that America remains a leader in aviation communications. We propose several rule changes to enable the use of 21st century systems that can make flying safer, including computer systems that will produce images of terrain and obstacles when the weather conditions are too poor for pilots to see. We also propose rules to harmonize FCC policies with those of FAA regarding the ADSB system, which automatically broadcasts GPS derived data on aircraft's location, velocity, altitude, and heading to other ADSB equipped aircraft and ground stations. ADSB will allow pilots to have the same ability to see other aircraft in the sky as air traffic controllers. It will also pinpoint hazardous weather and terrain, identify ground obstacles, and give pilots important flight information, such as temporary flight restrictions. <clears throat> Ultimately, ADSB will increase the number of flights possible and permit aircraft to fly more directly from point A to point B, saving time and money and reducing fuel burn 
and emissions. And while all of these proposed changes are laudable, I recognize that several of these proposals do include expanded operations in spectrum bands that already have existing licenses or other users, including some that involve public safety. For example, as we propose new rules for a broadband system for airport surface operations, we must also ensure appropriate spectrum coordination to avoid interference to federal users and flight test operations in the same band. Interference to these operations could lead to a catastrophic accident. I fully support the efficient use of spectrum, but will be paying close attention to interference related concerns. Things have changed a lot since the early 20th century, but America remains a center of innovation and aviation communications and navigation. I'm proud that the FCC is doing its part to encourage such progress, and I support this item. Thank you to the Wireless Bureau for your hard work. Thank you, Commissioner. This summer, I will join millions of Americans in boarding an airplane to reach my destination. Now, some might take for granted that flights will be safe. But not me, in part because I know that a lot of work goes into ensuring that thousands of flights take off and land smoothly in our country every single day. A critical aspect of aviation safety is provided by wireless communications, and that's where the FCC comes in. The Commission's Aviation Radio Service uses dedicated spectrum for aviation communications. These services enable aircraft and ground services to coordinate important safety functions, like guiding aircraft takeoff and landing, routing aircraft on the, air, on the ground and in the air, helping pilots avoid obstacles, and contacting search and rescue authorities in the event of an accident. I've often said that it is important for the FCC to update its rules to reflect current technological and marketplace realities. And that's certainly the case when it comes to rules impacting aviation safety. We want our aviation system to benefit from cutting edge technologies in order to ensure that Americans are safe, whether in the air or on the ground at an airport. And so today we kickstart the process to modernize our aviation radio service rules to enable the use of today's state of the art safety enhancing technologies. For example, we propose to allocate spectrum and establish service rules for enhanced flight vision system radar to enhance pilots' detection of objects in degraded visual environments, such as fog. Admittedly, many of the changes we propose are very technical and involve things like vehicle squitters, automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, and unicom stations. They might not be familiar to the flying public, but they will be appreciated nonetheless by everyone who will spend some time in the air in the years to come. I look forward to reviewing the responses from our commenters and working with my colleagues and the Commission's terrific staff on bringing this proceeding in for a landing. Uh, this particular proceeding reflected the best interdisciplinary tradition of the Commission, and so my gratitude extends to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the In International Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of Engineering and Technology, and last but not least, the Office of General Counsel. This was truly an all hands on deck effort. Uh, with that, we will move to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approved. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approved. Commissioner Starks? Approved. The chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted. The digital privilege is granted as requested. Thank you very much. Uh, this time, does anyone have any announcements? Yes, oh, I have one. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, I wanted to just take this moment and introduce Chris McGillan to our office. He is our latest intern, one of only six that we've had in my time here. He comes to the agency from the University of Colorado Law School. Some of you are familiar with that. He previously spent eight years in the U.S. Air Force as a pilot and spent time as a government contractor, originally from Michigan. Uh, so this is his first week on the job, and we want to thank him for all the work that is to come. Sounded ominous. ominous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, Commissioner Grody. I want to introduce uh, our three summer interns, uh, Francis, Shelby, and Andrew. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Francis. If you can stand up so that uh, everyone gets an idea of who you are. Uh, Francis, he's currently working. Uh, attending Tufts University, where he's a rising junior studying international finance and French. In this upcoming school year, he'll be doing a year abroad at the London School of Economics. Uh, last summer, he worked for Senator Thune on Senate Commerce and previously worked as an intern for Senator Tim Scott from his home state of South Carolina. So I guess we're going to have to put you on the spot there. Are you uh, Clemson or USC? Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> 
No need for a buzzer that is a reference to the school's mascot. <laughs> Uh, Shelby is a rising third year student at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. She's originally from Florida. Uh, Shelby's interested in both antitrust and telecom law, so she came to the right place, I think. She's also active in her law school Silicon Flatirons program. So thank you to welcome you. And you also have a dog that I forgot the name. It's Miss Coda. Miss Coda, okay. And did the dog make the, the trip with you out here? Okay, all right, well, we'll keep an eye on that remote. Just be, these things can be vetted in the office, by yeah. the way. <laughs> this is the one time Just that we have to talk, talk with each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And finally, uh, Andrew, uh, he's a rising 2L at GW Law, and he's originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He told me that's the proper way to say that. <laughs> he spent the past year working uh, for NCTA, where he worked on such sleepy topics as net neutrality and privacy. <laughs> and previously, he worked at... Freedom Works as an economics researcher, so we're glad to have the trio uh, on board for the summer. Thanks. Uh, uh, Commissioner Res or did, did you both do? Commissioner Sarks? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have four interns All right. Right here. Yes, um, and have been joined by uh, them here just over the last two weeks. And as my legal advisors are referring to them as the Calvary. Uh, so first we have Brylin Drotty, who is at the University of Colorado School of Law. Before law school, Brylin worked as a paralegal for a small civil litigation firm and an immigration firm. She's a graduate of Tulane University, where she completed her economics degree in three years. Brylin grew up on a horse farm outside of Boulder, where she has three horses and two dogs. Next, we have Mo Savdari, who is a joint MBA Master of Public Policy MPP program at Harvard University. He hails from Peoria, Kansas. Peoria. Illinois. I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, Mo. Pe Peoria, Illinois. And such a bias towards Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Objective. Previously worked at Facebook. Before then, Mo was a member of Teach for America where he taught science to at-risk kids at an alternative school in Dallas. Mo's a big traveler, has been to all 50 states. Thanks, Mo. Next, we have Matthew Tettelbach, who's pursuing his master's degree in public policy and data analytics at Carnegie Mellon. Matt is also a former teacher and is passionate uh, about using data to drive and improve outcomes in the public sector. One of his recent work projects was mapping and coordinating multi-organizational disaster relief efforts following Hurricane Harvey. And like Mo, Matt is an avid traveler, has visited all 50 states uh, and over 20 countries. Thanks, Matt. Finally, we have Michael Weingartner, who is at the University of Pennsylvania, where he researches domestic te telecommunications and privacy regulations alongside global data security policy. Prior to law school, Michael worked in education, opioid recovery, and as a comedian, where he wrote <laughs> and performed political satire. <laughs> The first time Michael ever wrote about rural broadband access, it consisted mostly of jokes and clips from the Minnesota Cat Video Festival, <laughs> which is a real thing, uh, <laughs> and is, in his view, one of the most pressing reasons to deploy nationwide broadband. <laughs> Thanks to my summer class. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I have a few announcements as well. Uh, first, it is my sad duty to inform uh, the audience that we have lost a member of our FCC family from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Uh, Greg Antosha, a former legal advisor in the Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division who retired from the FCC in 2017, uh, passed away on May 25th. Uh, Greg had a very impressive career, having graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1978, uh, getting a master's in political science from Wichita State University in 1981, a JD from the University of Denver in 1985, and a PhD from the University of Missouri, St. Louis in 1998. Uh, Greg loved this country and he served in the United States Air Force as an active duty officer and as a judge advocate in the Department of Defense. He continued his military career in the reserves when he joined uh, the FCC. He was recalled to active duty in support of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, serving the office of the Secretary of Defense. He spent 36 years in civil service and military and private law and in-house corporate roles with expertise in everything from cybersecurity 
to telecom regulation. He was an accomplished writer uh, with many publications of note, and I want to uh, extend my gratitude to him for his public service and my condolences to his family and friends here at the commission uh, on his passing. Uh, next, uh, Shreel Ismail, who is here. Uh, in accordance with the tradition, I'm afraid you've got to rise and let us recognize you. Uh, after 20 years of distinguished service here at the FCC, Shereel is leaving the agency to pursue other opportunities. Uh, he joined the FCC in 1996 after serving as a member of the Joint Congressional Conference Committee that uh, negotiated the Telecom Act of 1996. He's most recently been serving as a senior counsel in the, commissioners, the Commission's new Office of Economics and Analytics, having served in a similar role in the former Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis. He also served as a Deputy Chief of the Cable Services Bureau and Deputy Chief of the Office of Legislative Affairs. One of the things I love the most, however, about Shereel's story is that it really is the American story, as he and I have talked about before. Uh, he was born in Sri Lanka, and he lived with his family for a short time in Zambia. Uh, he first came to America as a student delegate representing what was then called Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, to the World Youth Forum, which brought together students from tw 32 countries for a three-month stay in New York in Washington, D.C. It's been a little more than three months. Uh, Shreel then went to uh, Georgetown, where he had graduated from the School of Foreign Service and from the law school. He served as a high-ranking uh, uh, staffer on the House Judiciary Committee before coming over here to the FCC. Shreel, we very much appreciate your service to our country uh, for the uh, symbol that uh, your success represents to all Americans, and we wish you well in the happy years of retirement to come. Thank you. Uh, next, Ann Stevens. I don't know if Ann is here. Ah, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Don't mess with WCB. That's a good. That's, that's, that's right. Uh, on June 21st, Anne will, uh, who serves in the Wireline Competition Bureau, will be retiring after 40 years of service at the FCC. An amazing run. Uh, she joined the FCC in 1979 as a general attorney in the Private Radio Bureau. Uh, she's held various positions within the former Common Carrier Bureau and now WCB, where she has served as an assistant chief and a deputy chief in the policy division since 1996. Uh, Anne has worked on literally hundreds of items over the course of her distinguished career here at the agency. Uh, she's considered one of, if not the, leading experts at the agency on numbering policy, and this is something that I got to see up close and personal during the LNPA transition when some were suggesting that this would be the end of civilization, but she expertly guided us through uh, this transition. Uh, and civilization, contrary to what you might see on Twitter, has not ended. Um, but on a whole host of issues, from the LNPA transition to the complex auction of toll-free numbers uh, or re number resource utilization, she is the go-to person uh, here at this agency. Uh, in addition to her unparalleled expertise, she's been responsible for the hiring and training of countless uh, commission staff over the years, and she's been a really strong mentor to them and many others across the agency. And we will miss uh, your wise counsel, uh, your generous spirit, and your uh, modesty and humility in approaching these complex task. We wish you the very best in the time to come. Thank you for your service. Uh, so we also have a couple of uh, interns in our office that I'd like to take a second to introduce. Uh, first, Brett Baker. Uh, Brett, if you don't mind standing. He has just completed his first year at Ohio State University's Moritz College of Law. In the fall, he's going to return to Columbus to uh, watch uh, Buckeye football, uh, and for David Shepard's benefit, watch them lose to Michigan, I expect, and, a dual, uh, <laughs> and continue his work on a dual degree with uh, Ohio State's John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Uh, Brett was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio, which as most of you know is the home of the NCAA tournament's first four, Kirk Herbstreet, and the longest sellout streak in all of professional sports. He considers himself a flyer at heart, but he went uh, to college down the road uh, to study political science and economics. Before returning to Ohio State for law school, he spent some time here in Washington at the American Enterprise Institute and the Americans for Tax Reform. But his favorite gap year job was spending a summer as the groundskeeper at his local rec center. It's going to be hard for us to top that experience here this summer, but if you see someone doing some yard work in the courtyard, it's probably going to be Brett. Uh, he's interested in ad law and looking forward to an informative summer here at the FCC. And 
we're looking forward to uh, educating them about that and all the other important stuff from 80s movies to pop culture. Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, next is Peyton Alexander. Peyton was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and he has spent the rest of his life since trying to avoid the hot and muggy weather as much as possible, and that's why he's here in Washington. Uh, Peyton crossed the pond to attend the University of Edinburgh for his undergraduate studies, where he went to uh, about as many whiskey tastings as lectures, I suspect. He returned to the United States in 2014 to be a policy analyst at Americans for, for Prosperity here in Washington, and now comes to the FCC from Harvard Law School. Uh, he's excited to learn more about telecom law this summer and is grateful for the chance to think about something other than exams. Uh, he entered law school with a keen interest in law and technology, especially space exploration. He's an avid follower of uh, America's new space companies and that uh, involves some of the FCC's work as well. So uh, we're excited to have him work on some of the high speed satellite internet uh, initiatives we have going here. Interestingly, uh, to members of the dais, Peyton has more Twitter followers than Commissioners O'Reilly, Carr, and Starks combined. <laughs> I think Commissioner Rosenworcel has lapped you, I'm afraid, but, uh, but he has more than combined, so perhaps he can provide some tips to some of the Senate-confirmed members of this agency on how to step up their Twitter game this summer. Can you explain how or why or what, 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 what is it? At Peyton Alexander, you'll have to see for yourself. <laughs> Maybe hit us up with a follow Friday tomorrow to give us a boost. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Uh, well, with that, if my colleagues don't have any further announcements, I would turn to our distinguished Madam Associate Secretary, who I would thank for stepping in to the breach uh, this morning with such aplomb, and ask her to announce the date of the next commission open meeting. Absolutely. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, July 10th, 2019. Thank you, and with that, we are adjourned.